It is so lovely to, to be with you. Thank you so much for your warm welcome. Uh, it's just been a joy to be with the Owens, to share the laughter, the tears, the kids, the giggles over this weekend for us. So we've had a blast. We're from Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm a pastor there. We've spent some time on my sabbatical uh, in a place called Louisville with our friends at Sovereign Grace. And it's been great to come down and spend some time with Brandon and you guys here as well. Folks, we love your accent. Has anyone ever told you that you have an accent? <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's been so lovely for us to travel to the other side of the world, I guess you call it the other side of the pond, and to share fellowship with fellow believers, disciples of Jesus Christ. It's been such a powerful thing for us to be reminded that the Lord really does have his people everywhere. So you're going to need a Bible this morning. Uh, let me invite you to come to Mark chapter 4 which is where we're going to camp out today. A wonderful passage that I, my soul has just been thrilled as I've studied this passage this week. Because I'll be honest with you, in Scotland, it's hard going. It's hard soil. You can come and chat to me afterwards if you like. I can tell you a bit about our country. But it's hard following Jesus. And hearing from Brandon, I hear it's, and contextually it's different, but it's hard following him here as well. And our souls need the magnificent, the glorious, the all-satisfying, the all-sovereign Christ, who's right at the heart of this passage that we're going to look at today. So please come expectantly to God's Word as we open it together and as we read. And let's pray that His Spirit will be moving in our midst as we take a glance at the all-glorious Christ. So here we are then at Mark chapter 4 and at verse 35. Come with me and let's read this slowly together. So Mark records this. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. And we trust that God would bless the reading of his word this morning. All oh, friends, our souls need this glorious Christ. Now, at the start of the year, we broke some bad news to our oldest girl. Do you want to hear the bad news? Yeah? Here's the bad news. Her swimming lesson which is the highlight of her week, her swimming lesson was canceled because of COVID. And in her response, I think she captured the sentiments of the near 8 billion people who currently reside on planet Earth. And she said, oh, if only that man hadn't eaten that bat. <laughs> and in that moment, I felt her pain and her frustration. Because I wonder if you're like me, there is no other point in my life where I have been aware of the fact that there are things going on in the world that are forces at play that affect my daily life, and I have got absolutely no control over them. And I think what the past years have done to me to my heart, as the Lord roots out the idols in my heart, 
I've been forced to come to the, the, the fact that I've fallen for the illusion that I think I've thought all this time that I'm in control of my life, of every single thing that, that goes on. You know, I've loved it when my mobile phone provider back in the UK has sold me a phone and said, power to you. I've loved it when Burger King have, have uh, lulled me in with a picture of a burger and they've said, have it your way. Our world has sold us the illusion that we're in control. And I love being in control of my life. I love calling the shots. I love planning. I'm a planner. But what the last season has done is it's come along and in my life, and I wonder if it's the same in your life, it has burst that bubble spectacularly. And now what is life full of? <clears throat> it's full of the rising cost of household bills. I'm not in control. It's full of rising fuel costs. I'm not in control. The health of my friends and family, I'm not in control. Even what my day looks like. Have you had this experience recently? All it takes is one positive test in your family and your whole day and your whole week is all up in the air. And that's before we've even raised our eyes to what's going on in the wider world, a devastating war in our continent, in Europe, which we pray the Lord would bring a stop to. But all these things going on, and I'm realizing I am not in control. And if truth be told, is that not a mentally scary and an emotionally paralyzing place to be, going about your day, realizing and carrying the sense that you are not in control? And if that's you here today, and you come in this building and you are fearful of what tomorrow might hold, then my invitation to you and to your soul is to come and drink deep from the well of the electrifying and encouraging news that's right at the heart of this passage. More than that, come and drink deep from the Savior and the Christ that's at the heart of this passage. Because he is glorious. Now, Mark's one aim in his gospel and in this section of his gospel is to help us man who's in control. He's in control, and this is the roundabout context. He's in control. He's sovereign. That's the Bible's word for that. Over the spiritual realm. He's sovereign over the physical realm. And here we get a glimpse that he is in control. He's calling the shots. He's sovereign over nature. And why is he doing it? He's writing it so that you and I, all these years later, all friends, that we would repent believe, trust, love, and stake our lives on this Christ. Because in Mark's gospel, Jesus has exploded onto the scene. He's been preaching about the sin that's in the human heart, the sin that's put us at odds with our Creator. He's been healing people, not the rich and famous, but the unlikely people that this culture had written off as no-hopers, the tax collectors, the lepers, the sick. He's been challenging the religious status quo. He is the very definition, and I hope this translates. He is the very definition of the cat among the pigeons. Does that translate? You use that one? The cat among the pigeons. Imagine pigeons and you throw in a cat, right? <laughs> but he is that. But he's talked about the reality of what life is going to be like as we follow him that we will know rejection. The world will want, not want to know. Get the parable of the sower, right? Not, not everyone's going to believe this word. He's talked about the shape of the kingdom. A kingdom life is going to be like a mustard seed. So unimpressive. As you take up your cross daily, deny self and follow him. He's been talking about kingdom expectations. You bring those together. It's unspectacular. And it's unimpressive following Jesus. 
And this is where my inner Scott kicks in because I love a bargain, right? I love a bargain, but I hate it finding out that I've been ripped off. And I wonder whether Mark envisages that very question arising in the mind of his readers at this point in his gospel. Is following Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? Well, says Mark, let me give you a taste of who this man truly is. Now, listen, I've just got three points of application for us today real quick, and they're tied to the three questions that the people in this scene ask. So come with me to verse 35 in chapter 4. And all that's about to happen, do you see, happens on the same day that began at verse 1 of chapter 4. So it's been a long day. Now they're at evening time. And Jesus says to his disciples, you see it in the text, he says, let us go to the other side. Now it's important that we get that because it's not like the disciples got lost at sea. It's not like the satnav failed. It's not like the rudder in the boat got stuck at an angle that they couldn't make progress. No, Jesus has said to his disciples, we are going from here and we are going to there. And that's exactly what the disciples are doing. Now, why that's important, it's important because it helps us see that what's about to happen is no surprise to Jesus. What's about to happen, he is in full control of. What's about to happen is about the disciples learning more of who he is in ways that they just cannot comprehend. And at some point in the journey, they get caught up in this huge storm. And in addition to the description that we get here, if you've got an NIV, I think it talks about a furious squall. I don't know what that is, but that doesn't sound like something I want to mess with, right? A furious squall. In addition to that description, here's what convinces me that this was a huge storm. You've got 12 guys in this boat, 12 disciples. What did so many of them do for a job? They were fishermen, right? If ever there was a group of people who understood the seas, understood what they did, understood what they didn't do, and knew when they were out their depth, it was these guys in this boat. Now, they always say, don't they, that when the professionals say don't panic, you normally know that you don't need to panic. But when the professionals start saying panic, that's when you know you're in trouble. Right? It's what they've done in the UK over the last season of life. Every time the government's told us to do something, they wheel in the chief medical officer in Britain and say, listen to him. So when he says panic, when he says we've got to take this seriously, everyone's taking it seriously. When he says it's okay, everyone breathes a sigh of relief. Here are the professionals in the boat, and they are panicking. This is big. This is a big storm. And yet, strangely, would you notice all this time, while they are in survival mode, would you see what in the text what Jesus is doing? Do you see it? They are panicking. Verse 38, Jesus is sleeping. They are drowning. He's napping. And here's where we get our first question, and it's from them to him. Verse 38. I don't imagine they asked this quietly. I don't imagine they asked this philosophically. I imagine they screamed this. You see it? Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So what's their question? Their question is, do you care? Jesus, do you love us? Because remember, these are the same disciples that Mark has just told us at chapter 3 are the ones that Jesus has called to come to himself and be with him. And they are making the trip that Jesus has told them to make. So we can kind of understand their question. Jesus, do you care? So here's our first point of application, friends. Let us never believe in a cold-hearted Jesus. 
You know the very reason that he's in this boat? The very reason that he's in the world? More than that, the very reason that this gospel will end with him going to the cross and dying for them and rising again is because of his commitment and love for them. Now, some commentators say of this scene, what a ridiculous question for them to ask. I think that's nonsense. I just look at this and I think, what a human question to ask. And I just love that about the Bible. I love reading it. It gives you the people and it gives you the things, warts and all. And I love it because it is full of people just like me. Jesus, do you care? Mark's showing us that just because Jesus is sleeping doesn't mean that he doesn't love them. Just because Jesus is seemingly inactive, don't think for a moment that he has ceased to be the one holding the stars in place by the power of his words. Now, friends, I don't presume to come in here and know your situations been doing gospel ministry long enough that I have cried with people and mourned with people through some horrific things. But if we're here today and we're asking why, you know, there's going to be many possible answers to that question. Some perhaps tied to the stuff that we've done. Or maybe it's just the reality of life lived in a world that is broken and is groaning and is longing for its creator to renew it. And I find often when you walk with people through hard times, all you've got as a pastor, all you've got as a friend, as a brother, is just to say, come Lord Jesus and make it right. Would you come and make all things new? Friends, there are a lot of possible answers, but let me just say, if your trust is in this Jesus, one of those answers cannot be that he doesn't love us. It cannot be that he doesn't love us. You sit there and you maybe think to yourself, how can I know that? How can I know that Jesus loves me? I've not had an experience like this. Well, friends, we can look to the place that the disciples will ultimately look for their answer to that question. Because I love it. You read on and you read the Apostle John writing his letter to the church. And John does not say, John, who would have been in that boat, this is how God showed his love amongst us, that he rescued us when we were in trouble at sea. It doesn't say that, does he? What does John write? This is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his only son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Atoning means that his blood has covered everything that we have done wrong. The forgiveness that we can know in this man, Jesus Christ, that he became sin for us. That our sins are forgiven in him, that we have life in him, that we have passed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He has transferred us all because of his love for us. And this is what convinces me that Jesus on the cross, it was not the nails that held Jesus to the cross. Right? Surely this shows you that it wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. No, it was his love for his people. It was his desire to be obedient to the will of his Father. That's what held him to the cross. His precious blood that's covered all of our sin. Oh, friends, do not base your opinion of the love of Christ for you by how things are going. Do not base your your thoughts about the love of Christ for you on how well you are doing. Base it on the cross, the risen Christ, risen for our justification. Oh, friends, we have forgiveness in life, in this Jesus. And what is he doing now? Where is he? He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, praying for us, bearing our names before the Father, just like the high priest would go into the holy place, bearing the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on his chest. Our great high priest is there, and our lives are caught up in him. Oh, the love of Christ 
for us. To quote J.I. Packer, great British theologian, really worth checking out. He's got a wonderful book called Knowing God. What a read. He says this, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven, brought in for supper, and given the family name. To be right with God the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. This Jesus loves us. And this same Jesus, do you see him? He wakes. And don't miss the utter absurdity of what happens next. Sometimes we get so familiar with this that we miss the shock here, right? Jesus doesn't grab a bucket, does he? He doesn't grab a bucket. He doesn't join in with the frantic bailing out of water. I'm sure is going on there. What does he do? He speaks to the sea. Take that in for a minute. He speaks to the sea. You ever tried that one? Is this not plain strange? If this fails, then it's time for the man with the white straight jacket to come and collect him. No hocus pocus, but no rhyme and riddle. He just says three words. Peace or quiet, be still. I'd love to have been in the boat at that moment, the disciples looking on, thinking, what on earth? What is going on? But the wind died down, and the sea was completely calm. I love this, friends. His relationship with creation is the same as the one that you and I have with our Alexa. <laughs> our kids have loved it. Our host up in Louisville has got an Alexa. They love speaking to Alexa, right? Alexa, play Frozen. Alexa, what's the weather like tomorrow? Alexa, what's the capital of Armenia? What's our relationship with an Alexa? We say it does. We speak, it responds. Now, what's going on here? It's the very fulfillment, and you can look at this in your own time, of Psalm 107. This psalm that's written to help the Israelites recount the power and the love of their God for them down the ages, that he will never change, that he is God with them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Can we have that on the screen? Is that okay? The words of that psalm. So friends, here's the headline in the Galilee news at 10. God's in the boat. Right? In the same way that in Genesis 1, God spoke and it was. Here is Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, the one through whom all things were made. And he's doing it again. And as a side, what we have in these few verses is a wonderful picture of who Jesus is. Right, theologians call this your Christology, understanding who he is, fully human. Do you see that? He's asleep on the cushion. We have a Savior who can sympathize with our every weakness. Fully human, and he's fully God, ordering creation, creation doing his bidding, creation existing for his glory. And so we get the second question, verse 40, and it comes from him to them. What does he say? He says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And what he's saying here is that your view of me is still way too small. Here's the second point of application, friends. Let's never settle for a small scale Jesus. In our heads and in our hearts, is he just a slightly better version of me? Is he like me on my best day? Is he like one of those lucky mascots that you 
in the exam hall at school that you two can place by your side because it's nice to have him on my team. Oh, he calls, would you see, the disciples to replace faithless fear with fearless faith. And let me just say, that is not about, and I love that Oksana started with that quote, that thought, it is not about us upping our spiritual game for Jesus. What was their line? It was, we don't need to look good so that Jesus can look good. Oh, friends, we need to be honest about our chasm of a spiritual need that so he can look all sufficient. What I'm realizing, and I see it in members of my congregation, maturity in the Christian life is not coming to the point where we realize we need Jesus less. Maturity in the Christian life is about realizing we need Jesus more. And what a Christ we have for our need. Let me just ask you, have you settled in your knowledge of who Jesus is? When was the last time that Scripture thrilled your soul? When was the last time you discovered something that made your heart sing? You know, we went to the pool yesterday. I was sitting next to Sean. I take it he's, I don't know if he's here today. Sean's telling me about what he's reading in the Bible. He's telling me about stuff that's thrilling his soul. And I'm chucking it back as well good stuff about what I'm reading in the Bible, not water. And it was just such a blessed moment. Friends, have you settled in your knowledge of who Jesus is? You know, one of the things we've discovered here that I'd never seen before in my life, and you'll laugh at this, is a firefly. Never seen a firefly in my life. It comes along, whoa, this thing, whoa. But people start telling me what you do with fireflies. What do you do with them? You catch them. You control them. This is mine. Oh, friends, we are never, we are never coming to a point where we've got Jesus. Oh, we can know him, but I love it. The Apostle Paul writes, there is more of him to know. There is more of him to pursue. There are depths to him that we have yet to plumb. Oh, friends, we have a glorious Christ. Let me just tell you, the Christians that have made a, the biggest impact on my life over the years are not the people that I can look at and see that they have got their life sorted. They're not the people that I can look at and be wowed by their amazing spiritual gifts. The people that have made the lasting impression on my life over the years are the people that I can look at, I can hear it, I can see it, that they have never stopped learning Jesus. There's always more of him to know and savor. And so as we watch the disciples here get a glimpse of his full glory as they encounter his full majesty, let's be challenged never to settle for a small scale Jesus. You know, I look out in the world right now and it's, and this is a, a quote I'd attribute our thought to Rico Tice, who's a big evangelist in the UK. It's full of people who have all the power in the world at their disposal, but have no love for people. And on the other hand, you have people who have all the love for people and a desire to do good things, but they've got no power to actually implement those things. Friends, would you see in this section that in Jesus Christ, we have one who is all power, and we've all, we have one who is all love. And so the third and final question, and this will be quick, comes at verse 41, and it's from them to them. What do they say? Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And so friends, here's the third and final point of application. Let's never miss out on a life-giving Jesus. For the question they ask is not only the big question that dominates one to eight of Mark's gospel, as Mark presents you with this man, this is the biggest question that any of us can hope to do battle with in this life. Who is this? I was texting Brandon earlier this week and we were both loving the fact that we get to spend our lives introducing people to this man the Christian life is a pursuit of pressing into that question. Who is this? See, at the beginning of this scene, do you notice how the storm is out there? 
Where is the storm, let me ask you, at the end of this scene? It's in the hearts of the disciples, isn't it? At the beginning of this scene, they're fearing the storm. But at the end of this scene, who are they fearing? They fear the Lord. Now that fear is not a fear that causes you to run away and flee the scene. No, 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 no. That is a fear that compels us to come close in delight. To fear God is to be so magnetically drawn in to savor his beauty that we come to the point in our lives that we can honestly say that there is no one and nothing else on which I am fixing the attention of my eyes and the affection of my heart. And what does scripture say about the fear of the Lord? It's the beginning of wisdom. Who is this? Now listen, just as we close, let me tell you about a 93-year-old man in our church family who died at the beginning of the year, went to be with the Lord. His face will go on the screen, I think, in just a few moments' time. His name was Archie. Right? There's a good Scottish name for you, friends. Archie. (laughs) Now, if ever there was anyone who I've ever met in my life who lived for those words, well done, good and faithful servant, it was this man here. I had the the honor of leading his funeral earlier this year, and what a celebration we had. Yes, we mourn that the sting of death is real, but we do not mourn like those who do not have hope. And I've never known Archie, known him for 10 years, I've never known him to be without physical problems. His eyesight going, his hearing blocked, his back posture going, his memory fading. But three years ago, I remember speaking to him at an evening service, and I just said to him, Archie, how can I be praying for you this week? Let me just say, if you want to up the spiritual temperature of your church family, that is a great question to ask one another. You'd be amazed at the stuff that comes back. And I would encourage you to be honest when people ask you as well. How can I be praying for you this week? And Archie could have said any number of physical things, any number of physical things, but he sat there in the pew And he stared at the ground and he thought about it for a minute. And then he said, do you know what the best thing that you can pray for this week is my walk with the Lord. And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, you're my hero, bro. You are my hero. And if you're young here today, friends, get your eyes fixed on an older generation who've pursued Christ right to the end that have been through some serious stuff. I mean, we are a generation snowflake, honestly, that have been, know what it is to lose a spouse, that know what it is to live through a world war, to know what it is to face unemployment and yet to be going strong with Jesus right to the end. Not that their faith was incredible, but they clung to a strong Christ. He says, would you pray for my walk with the Lord? I just remember being blown away by that. Here was a man who was coming to terms in his body with the fact that he was not in control. He was not in control and ever increasingly so. And yet what did he know? That when the storms of life come and the boat of life rocks, it's good to be near the one who controls the wind and the waves. Let me just close with these old song lyrics and then we're done and we'll pray I think they'll go on the screen we love this hymn at home will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife when the strong tides lift and the cables strain will your anchor drift or firm remain We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Why don't we pray together, friends, as we close. And maybe just in the silence now, you want to bring your own prayers to the Lord. Maybe 
things in your life that you're fearful of, maybe things in your life where you think you know the sin in your heart, friends, would you run to a glorious Christ and experience the forgiveness in Him? And so, Father, we thank you for this picture of Jesus. And to know the truth of Romans 8, right at the end there, that if our trust is in Him, that there is nothing that is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray for my dear friends here that a glorious picture of this Jesus would capture their minds and thrill their hearts. Who is this? Father, we just praise you for who you are today. And we thank you that you hear us, not because of the things that we say. You hear us because we pray through and in the precious name of this Jesus. Amen.